Apple Note and smart speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's seven o'clock. Good evening. I'm Aidan Delaney. Gardaí are investigating after a man was stabbed during an incident in County Cavan this morning. A man in his 20s was attacked with a knife during an assault in Baileyborough in the early hours. He was taken to hospital with a suspected stab wound to the neck. Two men, both in their 20s, were arrested and taken to Baileyborough Garda Station, where they're currently being detained under Section 4 of the Criminal Justice Act. A Garda who coercively controlled and subjected his terminally ill ex-girlfriend to years of abuse has been jailed for three years and three months. Before sentencing him today, the judge told Paul Moody, who was based at Irish Town Garda Station in Dublin at the time, that he had put her through hell. He described the tens of thousands of messages he sent over the course of their relationship as vile and obscene. Moody was caught after a colleague came across the messages on his phone. And outside court today, Detective Inspector Cormac Brennan urged anyone in an abusive relationship to come forward. To any person in an abusive relationship, you have done nothing wrong. You do not need to accept it. You are not alone. Please take that first step and speak to somebody. And Garda Síochána is committed to tackling domestic abuse. It does not matter who the abuser is. Plans to double fines for speeding offences and not wearing a seatbelt have been dismissed as window dressing by a former transport minister. There's been an increase in the number of people killed on the road so far this year when compared to the same period last year. 94 people have lost their lives so far, an increase of 28. And a charity that supports the well-being of the LGBT plus community is reminding people that anyone of any sexual orientation is vulnerable to monkeypox. The HSE will be offering two shots of the smallpox vaccine to gay and bisexual men, as well as men who have sex with men. The virus is predominant in this group at the moment, though it is not a sexually transmitted disease. And that's it for now. We'll have more in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Eat, sleep, beach, then repeat. Grab a Ryanair low fare this summer. Tonight will be dry for most as showers largely die out. Lowest temperatures of 6 to 11 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Round on Off the Ball. With Gillette for an effortless finish to your day. New Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. This is News Talk. Hello there, you're welcome along to Tuesday's Off the Ball to the World Athletics Championships in Oregon through its fair share of interesting stories. Carl Dennehy is going to join us after nine to discuss everything from records tumbling to Sydney McLaughlin, an athlete very much en route to superstardom. We'll have Sarah O'Donovan with us as well on the weekend's Camogie semi-finals. Meanwhile, Cristiano Ronaldo arrived at Carrington today for crunch talks with Manchester United is the word. Interestingly, Alex Ferguson arrived five minutes after Ronaldo. Andy Mitten will uh, check in this hour on the Ronaldo situation and what he's made of Eric Ten Hag's first pre-season at Old Trafford. So Andy Mitten coming your way this hour. Plus, between eight and nine, Mick Foley, Morris Brosnan and Colin Keyes, three journalists with us to reflect on the 2022 men's inter-county football season that was. 53106, the text number. We're at Off The Ball on Twitter. Arthur O'Dea is in studio. Hello. How are you? And Richie McCormack. Hello to you. I was like getting musical accompaniment there for a second. I like it. How are you, you, Joe? You were briefly. What I suspect you were hearing, seeing as we heard him yeah. there, uh, he, he started, so we'll let him finish. <laughs> uh, what I suspect you heard there was Stephen Doyle at Tallis Stadium. Hello, Stephen Doyle. Well, Joe, technically you didn't hear me. You heard Gilbert O'Sullivan with the, yes. uh, the top hit, uh, Hold Me Close. What be, sorry, David Essex, wasn't it? Bloody one, my goodness. David Essex, Steve David O. David Essex. Jesus. I always get them two mixed up, Richie, because they got nice curly hair and all that. Lovely kind of barnets. Yeah. Lovely barnets, yes. So, David Essex and Homie Close, Joe, that's who you heard. Um, Stephen, thanks for checking in. We'll talk to you later on. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, you are at Tallis Stadium. Shamrock Rovers against Ludogrets. Uh, this one feels in, uh, well, foregone conclusion territory. Either that, Stephen, yes. or you're in for the comeback of all comebacks. Well, I tell you one thing. If we get a comeback in this game, it will be sensational because obviously Shamrock Rovers beaten 3-0 in the first leg in Razgrad against Ludogorets, who are top of the Bulgarian Premier Division at the moment after three matches in their new season. They got a draw at the weekend against Seskia Sofia. They uh, made four changes for that match, uh, bringing their sub-keeper and a couple of, uh, who would you say, reserve attackers in for that game. But um, they've gone fairly full strength for this uh, game tonight, Ludogorets. They've just made two changes to the team from last week, dropping out our Jonathan and Cicchino, and they bring in Kirill Despidov 
and Jan Karninchik. And uh, Despidov, interestingly, uh, played 25 matches last season, got six goals and 10 assists. So a pretty live wire attacker uh, coming to Tallis Stadium. And I'm sure after missing the leg last week, he will fancy impressing his boss this evening. The Shamrock Rovers team, Joe, showing three changes from the side that played Ludogorets in Razgrad last week. Uh, Sean Gannon comes in for Roberto Lopez, who injured his knee in the Rovers draw against Drogheda United in the Premier Division last Saturday afternoon here at Tallis Stadium. That's a really big blow for Shamrock Rovers if they want to try and keep this game tight, as we all know. Um, Roberto Lopez, an international footballer. He's the anchor of that back three, so losing him is a big blow, but they do have the experience of Sean Hoare Hoare and Lee Grace in there as well, and Sean Gannon himself, sure. Look, he's got uh, bundles of uh, Champions League experience with Dundalk as well, and perhaps might have been feeling a little bit put out that he wasn't uh, starting the game last week against Luda Goretz. Um, The other two changes then for Shamrock Rovers coming in are Aaron Green and Graham Burke up front. So uh, they replaced Dylan Watts, who was playing midfield last week, and uh, Rory Gaffney. Now, Gaffney's on. uh, Well, he's in a bit of danger of being suspended if he gets another yellow card, so they want to try and keep him ready for the match next week because even if they don't win the course next week, they will drop into the Europa League and uh, they will have a match there, and those cards do carry over. So they want to keep Rory Gaffney for what could be a more important game next week. Dylan Watts perhaps losing a bit of pace there with him, dropping out of midfield, and uh, with uh, Aaron Green coming in up front. So the Rovers team from back to front, it's Manus in goal, back three of Gannon, Hoare and Grace. It's Ronan Finn, the captain on the right wing, Andy Lyons on the left wing, and then it's Tell, O'Neill and McCann. Tell dropping in from the uh, four position that he played last week into midfield, and then it's Aaron Green and Graham Burke playing up front for Shamrock Rovers. And speaking to a few of the supporters around the ground as well, Joe, a lot of them keeping an eye on that other game that's happening in Croatia tonight. Of course, Dinamo Zagreb and Skupi. Uh, they finished their match 2-2. Sorry, I play, should say um, their game, the second leg being played in North Macedonia, but Skupi hosting that one after taking a very impressive 2-2 draw against Dinamo Zagreb, a side I've seen a lot of over the last couple of years, uh, commentating on them in the Champions League. Dinamo Zagreb, very strong side. I'd imagine they'd put out a stronger team this week and uh, will go all out for the win against Skupi. And whoever wins that goes on uh, to face the winner of this tie in the next round of the Champions League qualifiers. That's the third round. And whoever loses that tie will play the losers of this round, which you would say is most likely Shamrock Rovers in the uh, Europa League quali- qualifiers. And Steve, just before you go, I had a kick off with a view to matters at hand. To what extent was 3-0 a fair reflection of the fair on, on offer last week? <sighs> well, I'm, you know, I'm speaking to a few of the press lads around here, Joe, and everybody seems to think that, you know, Shamrock Rovers, perhaps if they could have kept it at 2-0 and got the tie over here at the Tallis Stadium, it would have been game on. And that really, the third goal they conceded was down to defensive errors. The head coach Stephen Bradley came out after the match and he said, look, uh, the players shouldn't have let that goal in. It was just a lack of concentration, not pinpointing at any one or two. It was really a systems uh, failure. Uh, thanks to a few different players just losing their focus in the closing minutes of the game but you'd have to say Shamrock Rovers didn't play um, to their strengths you would say in the first half of that match show they weren't as good as they could have been and they really lost that game in the first half and uh, the pace up front was what killed them I think uh, with uh, all the uh, the Ludogretta tactic a lot of pace up there a couple of Brazilian players who uh, really did uh, make it hard for them so I would have to say that I, I think on the balance of play I thought 3-0 really was a fair result but you know, it does put the, the tie really um, out of reach for Shamrock Rovers. But that said, Joe, look, they're playing at Tallis Stadium here. They've shown against big sides before they can compete. The likes of AC Milan last year in Slovan Bratislava. If they get an early goal here, they could uh, have Luda Gretz, uh, a little bit feeling a little bit um, uh, shaky. And then who knows after that? OK, very good, Stephen Doyle, for the time being. Thank you. At Tallis Stadium, regular updates with Stephen across the... Evening, Arthur O'Dea here in the studio. Richie McCormick with us for the news round as well. I mentioned Carl Dennehy will be on after nine o'clock to talk about the World Championships. So Sydney McLaughlin is, uh, well, already a superstar, but soon to become household name uh, superstar. She's 22 years of age. She's just one of the stories we'll be talking about just to whet the appetite. But she uh, destroyed the 400 metre hurdles record, her own record, uh, we should say, at 22 years of age. She has lowered the record four times in just over a year. It's getting boring for her breaking her own record at this stage, but um seems to be a very three-dimensional uh, personality. Jonathan Lewis, a great piece of better in The Guardian. So, you know, she is um, born to parents who were star athletes. Her brother and sister, growing up star athletes, went to Union Catholic, where the school fees are $20,000 and the expectations were... 
uh, stratospheric and she broke all the school records, state records, um, and her career has progressed seemingly. And, you know, for instance, just last year, she was 21 years of age. And three days after she broke the world record at the Olympic trial, she was in her car and um, talking to her phone camera to the world saying, I don't know what's happening. I achieved one of my life's dreams and the people who I thought would be most excited don't even care. And she was, you know, crying and tears rolling down her face. You can do everything right. It'll never be enough. There's always a problem with you. It's a sick world. And so uh, there's more going on than meets the eye with Sydney McLaughlin. That's just one of the stories. Do we know who that was about? World champions. I don't know. I guess she's talking about people close to her. I don't know. Good grief. So uh, just one of the questions for Carl Dennehy after uh, nine o'clock, as well as records tumbling in most, if not all the divisions, like certainly the men's uh, sprint division because of Usain Bolt, they're not tumbling exactly, but um, they are in different uh, categories. So, uh, And we'll check in on how the Irish went as well at the World Championships in Oregon. I think it passed people by yeah. a touch here, didn't it? Uh, the time difference was a bit of a nightmare. Like, it's it's really kind of, it was, it would really have to be almost your, I suppose for most of us, what would be the World Cup in football, say the biggest kind of global event like that, to be sure you're getting up at whatever time to watch it. It, it did definitely pass me by now, to be honest. Yeah. So Carl Denny is with us after nine. Sarah Dunham as well. She'll be talking about the Camogie All Ireland final, which is very much on the horizon now. Um, between eight and nine, we have Morris Brosnan of the 42, Mick Foley of the Sunday Times, Colm Keyes of the Irish Independent. They will uh, run the rule on the 2022 inter county men's football season uh, that was. So that is all on the way. Richie, we should get into the news round. As ever, it is with thanks to Gillette for an effortless uh, finish to your day Gillette Labs and uh, you were starting with mention presumably of that game in Tala this evening Yeah Shamrock Rovers 3-0 down from the first leg they're taking on Ludogratz as Steve-O mentioned there tonight at Tala Stadium three changes for Rovers as Steve-O mentioned uh, into the attack come Aaron Green and Graham Burke uh, Rory Gaffney and Dylan Watts dropped to the bench and Sean Gannon replacing the injured Roberto Lopez on the right-hand side of a three-man defence. And as a measure of the task that Rovers are facing tonight, uh, Ludogretz able to refresh their attack with the addition of Kirill Despotov, a man with over 30 Bulgaria caps to his name. And Rovers, should they drop into the Europa League, will play either Dinamo Zagreb or North Macedonian champion Shkupi in the Europa League qualifiers. They will resume their tie level at 2-2. That game also underway at 8. Meanwhile, England are unchanged for tonight's semi-final with Sweden at Women's Euro 2022. The Swedes made two changes with Hannah Glass and Sofia Jakobsen coming into their side. Kickoff at Bramall Lane is at 8. Bramall Lane, an odd choice for that game, Rich. I saw lots of journalists complaining that it's just far too mm-hmm. small to host it, both in terms of uh, the desired attendance. They could have sold this out three times mm-hmm. over. And it's not big enough to fit all the media. Yeah, uh, uh, Bramall Lane uh, is one of the older school grounds, uh, I think, in, in circulation for the Euros. And at the same time, they don't want, they didn't want to overshoot themselves. I think that the worst thing that could happen in any tournament is overselling your, your final venue. I think we saw it to a degree in the Euros uh, last year. Uh, Wembley being used for this would probably, I think, it would take away from the specialness of the final. I think the place will be rocking tonight. Like it'll, it'll be absolutely insane in there. The people who manage to get the 30 odd thousand tickets inside Bramall Lane, it'll be a fantastic atmosphere. And that's what you want for a women's semi final in the Euros. Um, yeah, I don't think many people will be crying about media facilities uh, regardless of the result tonight, to be fair. Take it out of Croker, says Richie. In atmosphere. <laughs> 100% take it out of Croker. Uh-huh. Take everything out of Wembley by the cup final. Now, Arthur, we had Michael Fenley on last night with Eddie Brennan talking about Brian Cody. Both brilliant, by the way, I thought. Outstanding, was, uh, yeah. And, uh, Outstanding. I, I thought to myself, I'd be interested to see if it gets uh, many downloads or views on YouTube and it's done very well. So, we, you know, it's good not content. Not you care about that. No, no, I, well, no. Not that, listen, <laughs> look, I'm not saying I define my happiness by that. No, of course. But let's just say I woke up in a better mood this morning. No, I was uh, No, but they were both um, sensationally good. I mean, we were joking at the end. I was, you know, uh, Michael, what's your story? He said, oh, look, we're on the cusp of sorting things out with Offaly. We'll know sooner rather than later. And uh, lo and behold, it does seem, Richie, now, uh, Michael Fenley won't be staying on with Offaly after three years. Yeah, he's going to have a lot more time to take calls from you, Joe. To be fair, Offaly are searching for a new senior hurling manager after opting against reappointing Fenley. The former Kilkenny midfielder had been in charge of the faithful for three years, winning the Christie Ring and Division 2 of the league, but they suffered relegation from Division 1 this year and they failed to reach the Joe McDonough Cup final. Fenley had been in talks with the Offaly County Board in recent weeks about extending his tenure, but was informed today that they are seeking a change in management for next year. So... I mean, he'll be in the conversation around the Kilkenny job for sure, has experience, much like Eddie Brennan, I suspect both of them. 
be in that conversation. They didn't really know know last night how the process uh, works. Yeah. Kilkenny not all that practiced at finding new intercounty manager. No, <laughs> how would you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What? How is it? You guys do it? I have no idea. It was nineteen ninety eight. They were children when he was appointed, for God's sake. Which was telling enough, and it was interesting. I, yeah. I found last night even. Um, I was just thinking back. There were four former intercounty managers on last night. Did we? Just by chance between Liam Hayes, Enda McGinley, uh, Michael Fenley, and Eddie Brennan. Yeah. And it's quite telling. Like I know we didn't get into talking about this with all of them, um, but Liam Hayes definitely touched on the the time that goes into it. Sixty hours a week, you reckon? And I wonder, like with. So if you get a Kilkenny job, that's fine. If it works for you, that's fine. That'll be worth it. That'll be you get everything. But I like Michael Fenley. It was three years in an awfully tough yeah. years. Two of them very tough years, obviously. But God Almighty, like it, it must be. I dare I say a little bit of a relief as well to get away. Which makes it all the more insane. Cody did twenty four. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like ah um, oh, the exception. <laughs> just kind of defined. Like, you know, just Except, like, exception's not a big enough word for what it was. But like it just yeah, it it's is. Free. It is a free, it's a complete misnomer. Like It's a little bit like Ferguson, I think, I suppose. That parallel is always going to be there. Yeah. But I don't know. Boiling I don't know how. Well. Boiling, I, yeah. Exactly. I, I imagine you have to construct your whole life around it, essentially. Mm. That it just becomes kind of a part of, no more than any job, that just kind of becomes a part of your life and you build around it and that's how it works. Yeah. He might have figured things out as well along the way that kind of made it more palatable real life. Or not. Or not. <laughs> Maybe not. Or not. Everything else takes a back seat. That's just the way it is. I did like, um, you should listen back to Eddie Brennan and Michael Fenley last night, by the way. They were very um, generous with their observations. And it wasn't just a Cody's great in every way kind of a thing either. They were, um, you know, it was a 3D look at things. But I thought Eddie's stat when we were going through, Eddie, you're, you played the eighth <laughs> highest number of times for Cody. And Fenley had the best uh, winning ratio. His record under Cody was played 70 matches, 165 drew five and lost five so basically if Fenley was in the team could Kenny seem to win and Eddie piped up with an amazing stat which is that uh, the year he won Hurler of the Year and Michael Fenley had his injury problems he only played in two training matches all year and won Hurler of the Year which was uh, it's outstanding extraordinary kind like, of and it's that kind of thing when you boil it down again like you go Kilkenny and it really brings to mind especially this last few days when Cody left how many amazing players have passed through yeah and you boil that down again like he's just another one of those Ballyhale hurlers yeah. <laughs> it's like Shefflin Reed. it's like oh god but it, it's fascinating when you look back on it and it's a little bit the last few years have been kind of a bit reminiscent of it you actually saw so such so little of them as well like yeah. they only ever really played a lot of the times during those prime Cody years as well they played four games a year well, championship I, always, I remember we, we asked Eddie this at a recent road show like the year they won in 08 wasn't that when they beat Waterford by yeah cricket score they had four games that year I think the closest they came to being pushed was by Cork in the semi-final and it was something like 10, 11, 12 point yeah. margin their two Leinster games they won by 15, 20 points easy and then they won the final after about 10 minutes I said that must have been a touch anticlimactic and, well of course Eddie Brennan said no it's not no. it's still, still wonderful but um, yeah the other thing that strikes you is you get to know all that team and so Tommy Welch here you see Jackie Tyrrell on TV or JJ Delaney on TV or Eddie Brennan last night or even Fenley last night was yeah. super impressive. You kind of, all of them to a man, like proper characters. Yeah. Like uh, self-sufficient types. You can, you can see how that dressing room was just full of steel and 100%. tough to rattle them, you know. They, they all had a bit, of, they all seemed to have a lot about them, I think. And there was that specific thing when they were talking about it and it is something they've highlighted. Aidan Fogarty on, Saturday, on Sunday highlighted it. The man management style Cody's and how it, you know distant w- distant and that's like and I know it's it's almost man management now you kind of people are kind of praised for how they cater to each person I'm sure he did cater to different people but there was still a, <laughs> well this is the line that I won't be crossing and one of the lads I'm not sure was it Michael already last night said there was collateral damage as a exactly. result players did walk away or drifted away because of the man management style and you, you, you did kind of it was a little bit sink or swim which I suppose enhances that character yeah. building element of it you're not yeah. off with you maybe he felt he had the playing pool that he could afford yeah. to have that environment whereas if you didn't have as many options you'd have to manage differently I suppose but hell 11 All-Irelands in 24 years 19 finals contested and all the other numbers it was, it's just insane so um, uh, that's uh, Fenley and Offaly at an end there is more managerial merry-go-round stories 
Yeah, the managerial churn in Ulster particularly continued last night with James McCartan stepping down as down senior football manager. He ended his second spell in charge after just eight months. McCartan is the fourth manager in the province to leave their position following this year's championship. Mm. And we're hearing from Liam Cahill now. Yeah, he says that Podrick Marr will be the perfect link between the players and his new Tipperary Hurling management. The three-time All-Ireland winner who retired on medical advice just earlier this year will work as a selector in Cahill's incoming team. Declan Laffin and TJ Ryan will be the other selectors with Mikey Bevins working as a coach under uh, new incoming manager Cahill. You'd wish him well, Port Mar. I mean, it was a devastating blow when out of nowhere he was told to retire from not just inter-county but also club hurling uh, with that yeah. neck injury and uh, it was complete shock to him. I don't know, like, uh, look, Liam Cahill knows what he's doing. That is a tough one to go back in as a player when you're only out of it a year as a selector, I think. I'm not sure as well, yeah. What could you possibly... And it's funny, it's something that Morris will talk about in the next hour on the GA. But like, at a time when everything is so specialised and you kind of really have to... You can't just come in and do it. You, you do have to almost now train yourself in some way or another. Now maybe, and maybe he's used his year off as a kind of opportunity to improve and learn more about how you deal with players from this perspective. But it is, yeah, I'd be, I'd be very interested to know what it is he's exactly expected to do mm. when he steps in. Because as you're saying, like, there'll be people in that, I don't, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but there might be people in that team who are older than him, yeah. still, who are coming back from injury. Yeah. Certainly of his age and his era. And then, of course, you'll have a lot of younger players coming through who'll idolise him. And maybe it'll, maybe it, it, it's kind of with that in mind. Mm. But it is, I don't know, I suppose his circumstances are so strange that he was still, he still had plenty of years to offer if all had gone well. And, and maybe there's a, Maybe there's some depths there we don't see in terms of just what he can, how he's going to, how he'll think, everything about it. He's a little, he's not just a guy who retired because yeah. his legs were out. No, I guess the tricky thing is almost parking the friendships and the relationships, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, God, yeah. That's the, that's the tricky aspect more than anything. So, um, interesting times over in Finland, Richie. Certainly are, yeah. Finland have sacked their manager with just over a month to go until their crucial Women's World Cup qualifier with the Republic of Ireland. Anna Signal has paid the price for a disappointing Women's Euros, which saw the Finns lose their three group games to Germany, Spain and Denmark, scoring just a single goal in the process. Finland's under-17 manager, Marco Salonta, will take charge for the September 1st game in Tala and their game at home to Sweden, which comes five days later. Yeah, very strange. It's texting, what was Fergie doing at Carrington today? Well, I mean, Manchester United, uh, subsequent to his arrival, five minutes after Ronaldo had moved to say that he was there for uh, just a, a, a customary chat with the board, which in and of itself is kind of interesting he's doing that. But you remember when Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was um, sacked back in October and Ferguson was at Carrington? Yeah. And again, it was noted he was there on that particular day and the line from Manchester United was, oh no, he was here for a suit fitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, just suit for a suit fitting. fitting. We, we, I mean, we couldn't possibly have Alex Ferguson's <laughs> no. suit size, you know, on, 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 uh, on record or anything, far from it. So um, it does seem that she is if, <laughs> you know, fitting. whatever Ferguson's doing, he seems to pop up at Carrington on interesting days. Well, he's just doing director stuff, Joe. That's what yeah. directors do. They they turn up and direct, and he's turned up to Carrington, and he's, di- he's directing matters, surely, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Whatever fashion that may take it just so happens that their most expensive player in terms of wages wants out and he was the one who probably massaged him into joining in the first place 12 months ago yeah coincidence though coincidence coincidence, coincidence. Andy Mitten uh, with us at uh, this hour and he'll also give us a sense of Ten Hag and how he's settling in at Old Trafford the uh, customary Ten Hag's new rules disciplinarian <laughs> articles are uh, flying in over the last couple of days so uh, for instance uh, I mean all of these things are just so cliched, aren't ketchup, they? Ketchup, ketchup, yes or no, Joe? Ketchup, yes or no? Uh, yes, no. Ketchup doesn't feature as a, like it's not the headline, but but okay. but 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 personal chefs are banned. Ooh. So, <laughs> I can, you can bet your bottom dollar that they they, they, they all have to eat their three meals a day at Carrington. How many were walking around? We are, like with their own, you know, Anthony Warrell Thompson struggling behind them with their pots and pans. Oh, 100%. Making them their dinner. That'd be the first thing I'd be doing. I think they all were. Absolutely, live in. It's the first thing you'd not do if you were that rich to get a personal chef. Absolutely. No. hundred. Oh my God, can you imagine the convenience of it? Yeah. I'll tell you in an arrow when I win the room in his show. Good man. <laughs> uh, alcohol yeah. is banned during match weeks is one of his other rules. Personal chefs are banned. This is Eric Ten Hag. Uh, latecomers, he's big on punctuality now. Latecomers will be axed and apparently there was a player on pre-season who was dropped from a game he was due to play in because he was late for a team meeting. Okay. Uh, there are weekly BMI checks. I thought BMI had been discounted. Yeah. That's outdated, isn't it? Yeah. 
He's bringing it back. Like that's where you have he's old school. You know, weight weightlifters <laughs> with like you know single digit body fat percentage, and they're being told they're obese on a BMI yeah. check. So uh, well, look, apparently Ayrton Hag yeah. BMI checks it is, and you're not allowed. You you no moaning to your agent. You've, if you have a problem, you have to come to me. <laughs> How can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, he's trying to obviously stem Leagueville, which is what Manchester United was last yeah. year. You know, leaks every um, two minutes. So he's trying to say, no more leaks, no more going to your agent, no more going to your friends. Come to me if there's a problem. So, I mean, how have we found out these rules? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> That's a fair question. You'll never believe what Eric said now. <laughs> yeah, we'll ask Andy Mitten that. Maybe Ten Hag did some leaking of his own. These always appear when there's new yeah, managers. No, I know, so maybe, I know. you know, he's like, look how, um, how much of a disciplinarian I am. So. Was it last season when the when the United the the the, the whole <laughs> the whole playing staff's list of orders at a meal from starter yeah. main course dessert? Was it Lee Camp having a great time with all together? He had two desserts. Dirty two. Whiskey. <laughs> so it's not that bad. It's Ronaldo it? spat yeah. out his salad leaves. Oh, that was it. Yes, and Ronaldo. Yeah, yeah. Ronaldo didn't have salad or, or dessert or something. They all waited for Ronaldo yeah. to get dessert, and he didn't. So then a bunch of them didn't. I heard it as well. I heard it very funny. This whole thing. I heard it, it referred well. to. It worked exactly. I mean, what nonsense! <laughs> they were absolutely rubbish. It was referred last year his signing as I heard it on the, the news today yeah. as a fairy tale. Ronaldo from signing. from what was a fairy tale signing. It's like this is this is some rewrite. We don't help ourselves the media, do we? No. So, uh, Dr. Alan Byrne, Richie? Yeah, he stepped down from his role as team doctor with the Republic of Ireland senior men's squad. He first worked with the squad under the management of Brian Kerr. He's been a fixture ever since. He will continue to work with the FAI, though, overseeing the medical needs of all the Irish international teams. But he's put in a hell of an innings yeah. uh, with the senior side. Very popular with all the players as well. So, yeah. um, incredible contribution. Where are we going next? Uh, as you mentioned, Cristiano Ronaldo has been meeting with the new Manchester United manager, Eric Ten Hag, today. The 37-year-old and agent George Mendes in particular are keen on a move away from Old Trafford. However, Ten Hag still views Ronaldo as being part of his plans for the new season. I just can't believe that. I just no, can't no, no, believe no, no, that no. Ten Hag is looking at Ronaldo saying, I think he's just probably more of a realist. Like. You're just what I need. What I need is an aging superstar that I'll get one year max out of to really build my empire around and he's not going to run for me. I just can't believe he's looking at Ronaldo thinking that. And doesn't want to be here. I, I find the whole thing, it's quite funny kind of how the whole thing's been covered. Like, at no point has it been, and again, <laughs> but any sense of treachery around the whole thing. He's just not turning up. And now he's coming in for a meeting. He's not back to, like he's missed the whole preseason tour. And he's back now just to have a chat, see what the story is. But ultimately, mm. I wouldn't be here if... I could help it. Yeah. You wouldn't have me here if you could help it. Yeah. I think I... And there's nowhere for me to go. And there's nowhere for me to go. Yeah. Meanwhile, Alex Ferris is just looking. Where do I get fitted for the suits, Where lads? I? Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> God <laughs> almighty. Again. <laughs> uh, Rich, last story or two, whatever you want to bring us. Yeah, off to Galway, the 6-1 to shot Magic Shigega has claimed the Colin Quinn BMW Mile Handicap to feature on day two of the Galway Festival. Casanova finished second by half a length at a price of 12-1 to 1, and the Jessica Harrington trained Cowboy Justice was third. While Stradivarius was denied a record fifth victory in the Goodwood Cup at Glorious Goodwood today. The eight-year-old beaten by a neck by the Aidan O'Brien trained Kiprios in the feature race. It's O'Brien's first win in the race since Yates was victorious back in 2008. We'll leave you with this one, Joe. Sergio Garcia says he'll hold off on resigning from the DP World Tour to maintain eligibility for the Ryder Cup. The Spaniard was among the first batch of golfers to sign up for the Saudi-funded Live Golf Series and look poised to resign his DP membership. However, Garcia says he'll hold off on resigning in the hope that he can represent Team Europe in Rome in some way, shape or form. Mm, interesting. Look, they need uh, a captain, by the way. Likely at the, from this vantage point, yeah, maybe. Richie, thank you very much. Nice one. Arthur, thank you. My pleasure. Your chance to win big. News Talk's Summer Cash Machine. Now, after Shona's win 